Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining me today on the show is Mr. Arun Jaitley, who's not only a senior BJP leader, but he is also a very eminent lawyer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jaitley, for talking to us here on Bloomberg TV. So my first question, from whatever we've seen in this entire Colgate episode playing out before the Supreme Court, it's no longer about observations, and I'll come step by step on what the Supreme Court has talked about in its written order. Is it something unprecedented in your entire public life that you've seen in front of you? It's quite unprecedented. And this was bound to happen. It was bound to happen because I thought this government had made a habit out of the political executive, the law officers and the CBI, each being more pliable. And most reports and charge sheets which were either being filed in court or being placed before the Supreme Court were being doctored in this manner. The political executive and the law officers thought that this was the dumb thing. It's only that they had an unfriendly pitch this time before the Supreme Court that the whole matter got ex exposed. And I was only waiting for something of this kind to explode. But otherwise I have seen in case after case, the CBI in this country was ceasing to be a fair organization. Somebody had to take it to task, and I'm glad the Supreme Court has taken the initiative. But the reaction, Mr. Jaitley, of the government seems to be as if nothing happened. Well, the government thought it is their right to regulate the CBI. The government thought that they own the CBI. The government, therefore, was uh, tailoring and coloring the CBI investigations in various cases. I have not the least doubt that but for the CBI, the Samajwadi Party and the BSP would not be supporting this government from outside. It owes its survival to the CBI. So it was not willing to let go of the CBI. Now this kind of a highly comfortable relationship between the CBI and the political executive, in fact, is not good for the system. A little bit of tension always keeps the system in check. Mr. Jaitley, just to quote from the written order now of the Supreme Court, the interim order that it passed, and it says there was no justifiable reason for the two joint secretaries to peruse the draft status reports and recommend changes therein, nor there was any justification for the CBI to allow these officers access to the draft. While so far the view has been that it was just observations of the Supreme Court, and yes, the Supreme Court has said finally that this is not our final word on it, Mind you, one of these joint secretaries was no less from the PMO. Do you believe uh, that this is a very serious point which is being now noted in an order by the, no less than the Supreme Court and the government cannot hide behind the veil that it was just observations? Well, this order shows a, a great deal of judicial restraint that the Supreme Court has exercised. In fact, if you see what, what really has happened, the law minister calling the CBI was an encroachment of the autonomy of the CBI. But these two joint secretaries vetting the report of the CBI is nothing short of a criminal conspiracy. I use that harsh phrase for the simple reason, who is this ta investigation targeted against? There are two sets of people who could be targeted in the coal block allocation investigation. One is those who took the decision to allocate the coal mines in an arbitrary manner. The other is the beneficiaries. Now, even if we keep the beneficiaries out, the target of the investigations, the decision makers, are officials of the coal ministry and the coal minister, which in this case is the prime minister or the prime minister's office. Now, as of today, these gentlemen are not accused, but they are certainly suspects, possible suspects against whom the investigation is targeted. I have never in my parliamentary career or in my legal career come across a case where the investigation in the presence of a law officer shows its status reports of investigation to possible suspects. Therefore, when it is shown to these joint secretaries, it is not merely a bureaucratic interference. It is shown to those two departments which are suspected of wrong practices. Therefore, the travesty of justice in this case is huge. And therefore, I say, when the Supreme Court uses somewhat a statesmanship-like language and says there is no justification in showing it to them. The Supreme Court is exercising restraint. The language could have been far harsher. What according to you, sir, should the government do? And I just want you to set the record straight. We've set
We've seen several reports, news reports, and I'm only referring to what we've seen and read, which say that the BJP uh, was okay with the law minister and the railway minister resigning and was there. If that were to happen, it was okay with passing certain bills. Is that accurate? Or are you saying here that the target is clearly the Prime Minister because he is the person at the end of the day where the buck stops? Well, the buck certainly stops with the Prime Minister. The Rail Minister and the Law Minister are prima facie guilty, but the Prime Minister was a coal minister. Now, these kind of activities are taking place when he is in command of the government. And therefore, to, not to go by the speculation of what we would be satisfied with, there are certain norms which we wanted to lay down for Parliament to start functioning normally. But that's a separate story altogether. But the Prime Minister must seriously now introspect how is history going to judge him. Is there a single institution that they have spared and not tinkered with nor weakened and not try to really shake the foundations of these democratic institutions. So are, are you saying, sir, that uh, you're not going to press for his resignation? I'm not at all saying that. In fact, we are very clear in our party, the Prime Minister, the Law Minister, the Rail Minister, there is no occasion for them now to continue in office. Hmm. Sir, I want to refer to a recent interview that I did with Harish Salve who was a Solicitor General even at the time when you were a law minister. And I'm just going to quote what he told me. He said, there was never a position where I didn't have the government's full support. I got immense respect from the law ministers, Arun Jaitley and Ram Jaitmalani. From whatever you've seen going on, we've had this government, one Solicitor General quits, prior to that an additional Solicitor General quits, another one quits after writing an open letter to no less than the Attorney General. Where, where do you think this is going, sir? Is this perhaps the worst relationship that you've seen of a government with its law officers? And what, according to you, is the locus standi of these law officers in terms of what they did in this entire episode? Well, uh, in the first instance, let me say they have not lived up to the dignity of their offices. Law officers are primarily officers of the court. They are constitutional advisors to the government. They must speak the truth, they must be firm, they must be fair in whatever they do. Law officers are not legal political managers of this government. Unfortunately and regrettably, a large number of them have become legal political man managers of this government. The reason why we didn't face such a situation and we had a very comfortable and a respectable relationship with the law officers, we never expected them to cover up for these scams. We had political challenges, but we didn't have challenges where individual culpability of the ministers had to be defended and we wanted the ministers to do a cover, uh, the law officers to do a cover up job. And therefore, I seriously feel if I see the whole uh, tradition of uh, Mr. Settlewad, Mr. Daptari, uh, 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 Mr. Lal Narayan Sinha, Mr. Soli Sorabji, Mr. Parasaran, I think that tradition has been badly hurt by what's happening today. So many would say that in many ways this government got a breather. The parliament session has ended. The Supreme Court has posted the matter for July 10th. What would your strategy be from here on? Do you, do you intend to keep raising the voice on this entire issue or is this just going to die down in the next couple of months? Well, let's not call it a breather. This uh, the Parliament is today not in session, but in India, fortunately, the other institutions are also very strong. When Parliament is in session, the focus is on Parliament. Otherwise, the media takes over, public opinion takes over, political protests by political parties takes over. The judicial institution uh, they always keeps an eye. And therefore, when institutions are crumbling, I have not the least doubt the foundations of Indian democracy are so strong that you have several institutions which will safeguard and watch public interest. Hmm. Sir, as a very senior political leader and a statesman, my question to you is, the view from the government is that you are not letting us even discuss or debate. You're stalling parliament. How would you react to that? Well, that's only half the truth. We are willing to allow them to discuss and debate provided they show some inclinations or towards cleaning up the system. Now, what did you have? You had a 2G scandal. The Supreme Court has indicted it. There are charge sheets filed before the court. People have been arrested. 
and you have a parliamentary committee where the official drafts almost gives a clean sheet to this government. You have uh, the coal block allocation case where the Supreme Court is being prevented from even knowing the truth because the law minister and the joint secretaries decide to doctor the report. You now have the railway minister who we thought was a more decent man almost being caught red-handed in the midst of what's been happening. If there is something seriously wrong with the state of this government, let the Prime Minister not merely resort to his usual templates and say there will be zero tolerance to corruption and that CBI will be an autonomous organization. Let him demonstrate some action. We'll take five steps ahead and are willing to cooperate in the parliament functioning. So most eminent lawyers over the last one week, including Fali Nariman, Anil Divan, that uh, we've spoken to, have made, you know, made the point that where was the question of ambiguity? The Vineet Narayan judgment was very clear. There was eventually certain changes even made legislatively to ensure that it's CVC, that is the master of CBI. And yet in this entire drama, we find that CBI went to everybody except CVC to brief them. Well, if you, if, you, if you carefully read the Vinit Narayan judgment, Justice Varma quotes extensively from an English judgment of Lord Dennings, where the language begins with a sentence, no minister of the crown, no commissioner of the police can tell the constable whom to investigate and how to investigate. That's a discretion of the investigation alone. Now, the mandate of Vinit Narayan, when it incorporated that English law was, Ministers don't interfere in the course of investigation. They can deal with CBI administratively. For instance, the relationship between the law ministry and the CBI only is, whenever the CBI needs legal advice, it can ask the law ministry on a question of law. Law ministers can't go and see investigation reports and start tinkering with the facts. So my next question to you really is coming in from a more larger question of the country. You've uh, not only been an eminent lawyer and a political leader, but you have a fair knowledge of the manner in which corporate India and its markets function. There is a great fear today that, uh, you know, in these difficult times economically, that we are probably moving only further down as a country in terms of the economy, in terms of reforms, etc., etc. How would you react to that? Well, I share uh, the, your pessimism, and I think uh, the, 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 the whole political agenda has got derailed. We've been so overtaken by this agenda of confrontation and uh, corruption that decision-making in relation to economic issues has gone down. I think the Prime Minister, who was primarily an economist and only secondary as a politician, must seriously introspect how in the limited months that he has at his disposal, he can restore the agenda back. But please remember one thing. If there is an environment of political confrontation, cooperation on economic issues also becomes difficult. Economic cooperation on economic issues between the government and the opposition is more conducive when the political environment in the country is normal. What, what would your advice be to this government to bring back uh, reforms, whether we are talking of the insurance bill, the land acquisition bill, these are all major reforms which people are actually looking forward to, sir. What would your advice be to this government to sit across and try and get at least the economic issues underway? Well, let the Prime Minister show his bona fides. Let him raise the bar of accountability. Let him restore levels of probity. Let him start respecting institutions. Once he establishes his bona fides, enter into a dialogue with the opposition. And as a mainstream opposition party, I don't think we are looking for a confrontation on any of these issues. Some of the issues that you mentioned, we are quite open to them. Hmm. Sir, in the last two or three years, we've seen a significant increase in litigation. And in almost every instance, it's this policy of the government, whether you look at any sectors, which seems to be questioned before various high courts. Would you say this is unprecedented? And do you believe that this is largely uh, a fallout of ad hocism in policy making or not being able to stand up and defend your own policy? Well, I think uh, it's a combination of several factors. Uh, one, of course, is a positive factor that being a society governed with, by the rule of law, 
we have a, a very active judiciary which is willing to look into everything. I think on matters of economic policy, the courts also must then think in terms of drawing the line that policy is really an executive domain. And unless the policy really contradicts uh, some constitutional or legal mandate, courts ordinarily don't interfere with policy. As far as uh, economic measures are concerned, if any such measure looks a little unfair or un illegal or unconstitutional, then the tendency of the courts to interfere would be absolutely legitimate. But then I think uh, activism and restraint being two sides of the same coin, uh, uh, all institutions must display some element of statesmanship, how far to go and where to stop. It's, it's said by a lot of eminent experts from your fraternity, the legal fraternity, sir, sorry, uh, that the judiciary steps in only when the executive is weak or any of these arms, when they become weak, the judiciary steps in. With the kind of stepping in that we've seen or moving in, as we've seen, would you say that it's a direct fallout of a very weak executive? Well, it probably is, but I must uh, tell you that I don't subscribe to this whole theory that because the executive is not doing its job, the courts must substitute the discretion of the executive. If the executive is not doing its job, the courts must then direct the executive to do its job. But to substitute the functions of another institution really hits at the separation of powers, which is very vital in our constitutional framework. The executive can never say there are a lot of areas pending before the courts, and therefore I shall start interfering in how to clear those areas up. That's the job of the courts and the courts must function. Similarly, policy, legislation, these are the jobs of either the executive or parliament and these must be allowed to function uninterrupted. So the other issue I want to discuss with you is something which happened last year for which and continues to, uh, you know, continues to brew for which as a country we got a lot of global flack and that was the entire issue of retrospectivity. You had this government overturning a Supreme Court order with a retrospective legislation. The minister went on to become president. A new minister comes in, says, you know, we are going to handle this. We are in talks. We are trying to conciliate. The matter is going to go to the cabinet, etc., etc. We are pretty much right where we were. Is this not an issue which really concerns you, the manner in which this entire issue, the retrospectivity was handled, and the kind of reaction we ended up getting from the global fraternity? Well, because of some uh, conflicts in my own mind, uh, uh, in my earlier capacity as a lawyer and the present capacity as a leader of opposition, I have refrained from speaking on the specific issue to avoid a possible conflict. Uh, if I've been consulted in some matter in the past, I don't speak on it. But on general, I can tell you, retrospective legislation is possible, but retrospective legislation must be a last resort. Ordinarily, I am uncomfortable with retrospective legislation irrespective of the circumstances, and it's only in the rarest of rare circumstances must the parliament res resort to it. What, would, what do you think, sir, the government could do and should do? Do you think it should have just come to the parliament and said, look, we made a mistake and let's just correct it? Well, I am reserving my opinion on this because of the indication, uh, right. reasons I have indicated to you. Fair enough, sir. So the other big reform that everybody in corporate India and globally is looking at is the whole GST. Uh, we keep hearing that there is progress being made, etc. But given the current situation, realistically speaking, so practically speaking, are you of the view that it's not going to happen anytime soon, contrary to what the government keeps telling us that it's happening soon? Well, I am personally conscious of the uh, uh, economic advantages of GST. But then GST is not an issue between political parties. It's an issue really between the center and the states. Now, within the same party, you may have a state government, which is a consumption state, which is not a consumption state, and they may have different uh, uh, attitudes. Therefore, the center is trying to engage through this committee mechanism, which they have formed. That's fair enough. But I thought at one stage, two to three years ago, particularly when Mr. Mukherjee when was the finance minister, that we were moving very close to it. And then suddenly a set of political confrontations have erupted, as a result of which this government has done considerable harm to center-state relations. States have become a lot suspicious of this government on account of a lot of political acts. 
also because they didn't realize that the central government would be fair in the matter of allocations uh, after the gst system is formulated so you have more states today which are suspicious of this government than you had 2 to 3 years ago and therefore when i spoke speak in terms of ending the environment of confrontation in order to build economic consensus this is one of the issues which the government has to keep in mind even on the gst issue but given the current situation sir practically and realistically speaking you don't see it happening any time soon i don't see it happening because i don't see uh, uh, the introvertish leadership of the central government being communicated with the states at all and therefore the apprehension of the objecting states remains there is an increasing discussion of view emanating out of uh, sir the bjp having lost the elections in karnataka and the view is that you are on the back foot and therefore probably the monsoon session will be far more calmer and you'll come around and let the parliament function but would you say that you are clear in your mind that these are the demands and you are going to continue with them what's your reaction to these views well we'll wait till the monsoon session and i hope wiser council prevails on this government and they take some positive action what would that positive action be sir according to you the raise the bar of accountability and take action against the errant mr jetley it's been a pleasure talking to you sir i really appreciate you taking your time out and talking to our viewers not just in india but across the world thank you very much sir